My name is Glenn Crocker. This is my daughter, Kate. We want to welcome you to the Easter service at First Church of Christ. And we're going to get started in about 10 minutes.
Welcome back. We're going to get started with our service in just five minutes.
Welcome, First Church. Hope everyone is doing well this morning, staying home and staying blessed. Stay safe, everybody. Uh, going to worship a little bit different this morning. We're going to practice our six-foot rule and beyond. It's just going to be me this morning. Me and the band all wish y'all a very happy Easter. We're going to break it down do a little more simple this morning. Feel free to sing along at home and enjoy yourself while you worship God this morning. Through every battle, through every heartbreak, through every circumstance, I believe that you are my fortress, you are my portion, you are my hiding place, oh, I believe you are the way the truth and the lie and I believe you are the way and the truth and the lie and I believe through every blessing and through every promise and through every breath I take I believe that you are provider, and you are protector, and you are the one I love, oh, I believe you are the way, and the truth, and the light, and I believe you are a new horizon and I'm set on you and you meet me here today with mercies that are new oh all my fears and doubts they can all come to because they can't stay long when I am here with you it's a new horizon and I'm set on you and you meet me here today with mercies that are new, oh, and all my fears and doubts, they can all come to, because they can't stay long when I Sit on you, and you meet me here today with mercies that are new, Lord. And all my fears and doubts, well, they can all come to because they can't stay long when I am here. You are the way and the truth and the life. Lean 
path grows from day to day, leaning on the everlasting arms. What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Freely forever 
forever. One day he's coming on glorious day. On glorious day. Glorious day. One day the trumpet will sound for his coming. One day the skies with his glories will shine. Wonderful day, my beloved one bringing. My Savior Jesus is mine. Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away and rising he justified freely forever one day he's coming on glorious day on glorious day on glorious day During this time of communion, I wanted to read a passage of scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 11. Starting in verse 23, it says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. During this time, take a few minutes to reflect on Jesus and what he has done for you. And then I'm going to have a prayer for us. Lord, thank you for the amazing gift of sending your one and only son, Jesus, to die on a cross for our sins. But thank you that that was not the end of the story. Thank you that on a day like this, we celebrate the fact that he rose again. And because of that, we all have hope that no matter what it is that's going on that's terrible in our life, that there is hope beyond what we are struggling with now because we have hope in Jesus. Lord, we love you and we thank you for him. We thank you for the grace that we have in our lives through him and through his sacrifice. And we pray that we'll reflect on those things, not just now, but always. Lord, we love you and we pray this prayer in your name. Amen. Oh, Lord, my God. When I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe display when through the wood and forest glades I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees when I look down from lofty mountain grandeur and hear the brook and feel the gentle breeze then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou Sings my soul, my 
Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God his son not sparing sent him to die I scarce can take it in that on the cross my burden gladly bearing he bled and died to take away my sin when Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home what joy shall fill my heart then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God how great thou art then sings my soul my Savior God to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou I know that my Redeemer lives. That's my Easter greeting for you today. You know that's a tradition every year, that when Easter Sunday comes, you don't use the ordinary greetings, but rather something that celebrates the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus is alive. He is risen. I know that my Redeemer lives. This is Easter Sunday, and I'm looking at it as a very unusual, very different Easter than many of us have ever seen before. And as I think about it, I'm missing the old Easter. I love the pomp and circumstance that sometimes goes with Easter traditions. I like the symbols of Easter. So for example, I like Easter eggs. Now not so much the eating of the Easter eggs, and I don't even go out and hunt them, but I enjoy watching my daughter when she was growing up, watching my grandsons now as they search for the Easter egg. And if you're thinking, I'm not into that kind of thing, no, no, don't dismiss the Easter egg because that is an old Christian tradition. It goes back to the early church of Mesopotamia. They took eggs, decorated them with color because eggs were the symbol of a life that burst forth from the shell, a great symbol of Easter Sunday. I miss the Easter lilies that decorate the churches. Now, personally, I don't care for Easter lilies. They're too white, too plain, too bland for me. I like the colorful flowers. But on an Easter Sunday, I like to look around and see Easter lilies, and we're missing those this year. I also am missing the color and the dress, the, the, Chris, the Easter attire. You know, a lot of us have the tradition of on Easter Sunday, we like to dress up a little bit. I remember the days long ago. When, when ladies would dress up in fancy dresses, wear their Easter hats, the men would be in their coat and tie. We even had a song about the Easter bonnet with all the frills upon it. Now, whether we dress up that much or not, 
I still like the idea of making Easter special. You may notice I put on a tie. I actually do every year at Easter time. It's one of those Sundays I like to dress up a bit. I put on a special tie. This one a gift from my grandsons, Jack and Josh. It, it's just a reminder of them and I thought appropriate for a day when I'm thinking about Easter, thinking about family. Because Easter is one of those occasions we've always enjoyed gathering family together, sitting together in church, going home for an Easter dinner. Not able to do as much of that today. I miss the singing of the Easter songs as we gather in worship and the message that would proclaim the resurrection of Jesus. You know, it's a different kind of Easter that we're experiencing today. But keep this in mind, that the message of Easter is not limited to a sacred place or a holy gathering. Rather, Easter is a message that can resonate even as we stay in our homes and we gather together in the online approach that we're using. All of us taking the time to spend some time in worship, in prayer, with the Lord's Supper, and a message about the resurrection of Jesus. And so it is I'm bringing you a resurrection message today, and one that I think you will appreciate. Now, those opening words I started with, my Easter greeting, tell me if you recognize those. I know that my Redeemer lives. Now, can you remember who first said those words? Now, if you're raising your hand and thinking, George Friedrich Handel, that's a good guess, because those are words that come from Handel's Messiah. That's the opening song in part three of the Messiah. It's the soprano solo. It's a great song. But remember, Handel didn't actually write those words. The Messiah comes from Scripture text. So you're going to have to go back earlier than that to tell me who first said those words. Perhaps you're going back to the Easter story. And you're thinking, well, maybe it was the angels who said those words. Or or maybe it was the women as they ran to the disciples and gave the report of the empty tomb. But it actually wasn't anyone in the Easter story who said those words. No, for those words, you've got to go back to the Old Testament book of Job. Job chapter 19, verse 25. It was Job who first said those words. I know that my Redeemer lives And on the earth one day, he will stand. Now, when Job said those words, he was actually in his own particular context. He was dealing with the troubles he's famous for in the book of Job. And as he's dealing with all these troubles, and as he's unloading to God in heaven with all of his complaints and his whining, at some point, chapter 19, he stops at least for a brief moment, and he speaks these words of hope and encouragement. I know that my Redeemer lives, and on earth one day he will stand. I'm going to take those words from Job, and I'm going to use them for our Easter message. I've got three things in particular I want you to pick up on as we celebrate the Lord's resurrection on this day. Here's the first thing. Jesus is alive. Jesus is alive. Boy, I see that so clearly in those words from Job. I know that my Redeemer lives. Now, you know, that's what we've been saying ever since that first Easter Sunday. Jesus is alive. Now, go back to that day, at least in your thoughts. You may recall how it happened. On Friday, well, Friday's when they crucified Jesus. That's when he died. And that was the buzz of Jerusalem. Everybody was talking about the crucifixion of Jesus, the preacher from Galilee. On Saturday, he lay buried in the tomb. There was probably a little bit of talking going on then, but it was a small rumble. It was a pretty quiet day. But then came Easter Sunday. And on that Sunday, this was the news that spread all through Jerusalem as the reports were issued. The angel said, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen, just like he said. Jesus is alive. That message spread like wildfire through the city of Jerusalem. Everybody was talking about it. The angels talked to the women. The women spoke to the disciples. The disciples spoke to each other. And even the enemies of Jesus, they had their little secret convening, trying to figure out, what are we going to do about this mess? You see, everybody was talking about the resurrection of Jesus, the story that Jesus is alive. Now, here's the interesting thing. Nobody saw it coming. 
Not a person, apparently, saw the resurrection of Jesus coming. Now, it wasn't because God hadn't warned them or told them, oh, they'd had plenty of messages. It's just nobody really understood. No one was there at the tomb, ready for Jesus to come forth, to welcome him and celebrate. The, no one saw it coming. You know what they should have done if they'd actually understood? They should have had a watch party. Now, see, I know what it's like to get up very early, middle of the night, so you can be ready for an event that's going to take place at the crack of dawn. I like to run the marathons, and when you run marathons, they traditionally like to start them early before it gets too hot. They often start it right at, at dawn, which means there's been many times I've had to get someone else in my house up out of bed, listen to a little bit of complaining, but she's still a trooper. We get up three o'clock in the morning, we travel, we get in position, and she's ready to take the pictures as I'm running a marathon. I know what it's like to get up early so you can be there for the event. Now, we've traded off because there's been many a Black Friday, the Friday after Thanksgiving, where my wife and my daughter and I have gotten up at 3 in the morning so we can be at a store ready to rush in as soon as they open at 5 a.m. and get whatever deals that they think are there. You see, that's what they should have done on Easter morning. If the disciples had understood the message of Jesus, they'd had a watch party around that tomb just waiting for him to come forth. But no one understood no one saw it coming. And even when the report began to spread around town and they're hearing the story that the tomb is empty and, and Jesus is alive, everybody was skeptical, at least when they first heard it. You'll find that was true, not just of Thomas the doubter, but all the disciples. They were skeptical of the story because they had found it hard to believe. But at some point, there came the evidence. And the evidence was compelling. I mean, the tomb was empty. You could do like Peter and John did. You could take off and run to the tomb and put your head inside and take a look and you could see for yourself the tomb was empty. You got to explain that somehow. And with Roman soldiers stationed out front to make sure that actually didn't happen and yet it did, you've got a mystery on your hands that you've got to explain. Well, the report is that the tomb is empty because Jesus is alive. Then there were those who were telling the stories, hey, we've seen him. He appeared here. He appeared there. We've seen him alive. And you've got to reckon with all those reports taking place on this Easter Sunday. Well, they started to believe. Little by little, one by one, the disciples started to believe the story was true. That Jesus is alive on that Easter Sunday morning. Now, as they started to understand this, a light bulb started to click in their heads. They, they started to finally understand we actually had been told this, we just missed it. Jesus had told them, they just didn't understand him. John tells us in John chapter 2 that from the very beginning of his ministry, one of his first sermons there at the temple, Jesus looked around at the temple and he said, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up again. They thought he was talking about the big temple building and John explains, well at the time that's what we thought, but he's talking about himself, his body. As it's destroyed, three days later, it'll be raised from the dead. And when that happened, they later understood the words he had said. It now made sense. Jesus had preached the sermon where he said, you know, a grain of wheat can produce a great crop, but you've got to first bear it in the ground and let it die, and then it can come to life and produce. They didn't understand how that applied to Jesus. And then there was the sign of Jonah that Jesus said more than once, something that even his enemies heard him say and remembered after his resurrection, because he had said it'll be just like Jonah. Jonah was three days into the belly of the fish, and then he came out, so it'll be for me. Three days in the belly of the earth, and then I will come forth. You see, they didn't know, but not because he didn't say. It's because they didn't comprehend, but after the resurrection, it started to make sense. And Old Testament prophecies had told the story of the Messiah, even his death and resurrection. Nobody got it. Not until after the death and resurrection of Jesus, and then it started to make sense. In Luke chapter 24, when Jesus was with his disciples after the resurrection, on that same Easter Sunday, Jesus said to them, oh, you are so foolish. You're so slow to understand what the prophets actually said to you. And then he made this statement. Did not the Messiah, the Christ, did he not have to first suffer all these things you've seen happen, and then... He would enter into his glory. And then it tells us that Jesus started first with Moses and then the rest of the prophets. 
And he did Bible study with them. He showed them what the scriptures taught about himself. And I'm sure he focused in on the death on the cross and the resurrection from the grave. Well, on that Easter Sunday, there's a lot of people picking up the news that the tomb is empty and Jesus is alive and many were coming to faith and conviction that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, ever since that Easter Sunday, we have still been celebrating the resurrection of Jesus. We do it every week in what we call the Lord's Day. That's the name that the early church put on Sunday, the first day of the week. I still use that name because I like it. It reminds me that Sunday is a special day. And not simply because it's the day the church gathers. That's that's important. And all the other things that we associate with a Sunday. But the underlying meaning of that phrase, the Lord's Day, is the day that He came forth from the tomb. The day He conquered death and brought us life. It's the Lord's Day. And we celebrate the resurrection every week if we take the time to remember the Lord's Day. And then once a year, every spring... We have Easter Sunday, a very special celebration of the resurrection of Jesus. But we do even more than that. We talk about it. We preach about it. We sing about it. We love to talk about the resurrection of Jesus and celebrate what happened on that day. And if you go through the scriptures, you'll find even in the Old Testament, there are a lot of prophecies and phrases that look like they were designed to anticipate that great day. One of my favorites, Psalm 18. Psalm 18 was a good psalm already, but in our modern times, it was taken, and many of you may recall the Christian rock group Petra, they put it to lyrics and tune, and next thing you know, many of you were singing it. The Lord liveth, and blessed be the rock, and let the God of my salvation be exalted. You know, it's words like that that help us remember what Easter Sunday is all about. The Lord liveth. And this is the day you and I should praise and celebrate that the God of our salvation has sent Jesus Christ to bring us our redemption. I said I had three things to give you, and the first thing is this, that Jesus is alive. Now, I've talked so much about the Easter story. I've got to take it back, though, to Job. Because Job's the one that said those words, I know that my Redeemer lives. And I can't say for certain that he's talking about Easter Sunday because at the moment, as you read the context of chapter 19 of Job, he's talking about himself and the situation he found himself in. You see, for Job, it was bad days, and you know the story of Job. He's in the midst of all sorts of troubles, uh, troubles unimaginable. He had lost all of his property. Everything he owned was gone. He lost all of his family, except for his wife, but he lost the sons, he lost the daughters. He'd even lost his good health. Job had everything taken away from him. Now, in the midst of all those troubles, he had his three friends who showed up. And they're not very good friends because they decided to keep a little distance from Job and talk about, well, you must really be a bad sinner. I hate to be too close to someone that might get struck even more with a curse from God. They suggested to Job that there was nobody still on his side. Even the Lord in heaven had abandoned him. You see, they wanted Job to understand, you you have no one to reach out to now. You have no help. And that's how Job felt. He felt alone. He felt abandoned. He felt like heaven was ignoring him as he cried out for help, as he asked for answers, and all he heard was silence. And yet in Job chapter 19, verse 25, in the midst of the silence, Job says, but I know. I know that my Redeemer lives, and on the earth one day he will come and take his stand. He still believed in the midst of all that, that there still was a friend up there who was going to come help him one day. That's the confidence of Job. Now, it makes me wonder, though, did Job have any glimpse of the future of the Easter story? Did he see Jesus rise from the tomb as he spoke those words? I don't know. Now, maybe... After all, in John chapter 8, Jesus said to the Pharisees, Now, Abraham, he saw my day and he rejoiced at what he saw. Holy Spirit gave him just a little peek. Hebrews chapter 11 reminds us that all the saints of the Old Testament put their faith in the coming Messiah, the promise of God, and that there's a heavenly city waiting for us all. Maybe Job got a glimpse of what would happen on Easter when he spoke those words. But regardless, 
whether he knew about Easter or said those words without knowing about Easter at all, those words of Job are words that Christians have been echoing for 2,000 years. I know that my Redeemer lives, and on the earth one day he'll stand. And I got to take you back to that text one more time because I want you to see, I know. When Job said that, it, there, there's no wavering. There's no, well, I, I, I think it's going to happen. I'm pretty sure. I'm fairly certain. I hope it does. No, no. He spoke with confidence. I know that my Redeemer lives, and I hope on this Easter Sunday you've got that same confidence as you speak of the resurrection of Jesus. I know that Jesus is alive. But the second thing I wanted to give you that I promised was coming, he's alive, but Jesus will redeem. That goes back to what Job said. I know that my Redeemer lives, and I've got to bring you to the concept of the Redeemer. Now, when Job said those words, he used the Hebrew word goel. A goel was a near kinsman, someone in your family, a relative, who is going to reach out in your time of trouble and help you get out of your trouble. That's what a goel was. It, it's a family member who's going to help you deal with what you can't do on your own. You need some help. Now, the way the goel would work in the Old Testament days, for example, he would rescue you from financial trouble. If you'd gotten in so deep in debt that they took all your property, perhaps even cast you in a debtor's prison, you're working servitude, the goel is the one, the family member who comes and pays your debts and sets you free. He posts your bell. I don't know if you've ever done that, but I suspect some of you have. You've had to reach out and help a family member financially when they were in trouble. That's what a goel did. Not only that, a goel would avenge when someone had wronged you. That is, I can't fight back and get vengeance for what they did to me, but this fellow says, I'll do it. And he goes and gets vengeance for what was done to you wrongly. A goel would also defend your honor. As your reputation is sinking low, he's the one that will stand there and speak in your behalf when no one else will. See, that's the word redeemer. That's the Hebrew goel. Poor old Job, he's standing there. He's losing everything. He's got even his friends talking against him. He feels like there's no friend on his side. And yet, he says, no, there is. Up in heaven, there is. You know, in Job chapter 16, he says, I do have a witness in heaven. I have an advocate in heaven. See, Job does believe that there is a friend, a friend in heaven, and he's there. Or as he says in chapter 19, my Redeemer, he lives, and one day he will come and take his stand with me. You know, that's a beautiful description of Jesus as we think about this Easter Sunday, because Jesus is our Redeemer, the New Testament says. He's our Goel, He's our near kinsman who reaches out and helps us in our time of need. And if you weren't aware that you were related to Jesus, well, spiritually you are. That's what Hebrews says in Hebrews chapter 2. The Hebrew writer says that the one who sanctifies, the one who makes us holy, the one who saves, and those who are saved by him, what well, you all belong to the same heavenly Father. And that's why Jesus is not ashamed to refer to us as his brothers his sisters, his family. See, he is in our family, and he's the family member, the near kinsman. He's the goel who reaches out and helps us in our time of need. Oh, that imagery works so well for Jesus. He rescues us from all the debt of sin, the trouble we got ourselves in that we don't know how we could ever pay and get out of it. And he avenges for us. He strikes out against our enemy who brought us all this trouble. And he defends our honor because our sins have certainly brought our reputation low, but he raises us up, calls us the redeemed, the saints, the children of God. And he restores us back into the good favor of God, back into the house of the Lord. You see, it's no coincidence that Job speaks of the Lord as the redeemer because truly that's what he is. And not only has he brought us redemption now that we can celebrate but there's more yet to come. Which brings me to the third and final thing I want to remind you on this Easter Sunday. Jesus is alive and he redeems and Jesus is coming. Jesus is coming again. As Job said, I know that my Redeemer lives. And on the earth one day, 
He will take a stand. Now, you may say, why are we shifting gears and going to the second coming? We're focused on Easter Sunday. Those two ought to be linked. Just like the Lord's Supper reminds us, as Paul said, when you break the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And he linked those two together. I'm going to do the same with the resurrection on Easter Sunday. Because you see, what happened on Easter Sunday is the setup for what's going to happen when Christ comes back once again. When Jesus returns, he's going to raise us from the dead. Oh, we're looking forward to that. He's going to raise us from the dead. That's been the hope of the saints all through the ages, that death will not be the final word, that there's something beyond death. There's a life yet to come. We sing about it. We talk about it at our funerals. We put our hope and trust in a Lord who will raise us from the dead. The Old Testament saints believed it. In whatever way they understood, they believed that there is a heavenly city waiting for us all. Hebrews 11 teaches that. And Job seems to have some concept of a life after death. Job can say, for example, in Job chapter 13, that, that my, my flesh, it, it's being destroyed. I, I've got all this ailment, this sickness. And if God goes so far as to kill me, even then I'll still hope in the Lord. That is, even if I die, I'm not done with the Lord yet. There's still something else that I believe is coming. Yes, the Old Testament saints, the New Testament saints, we have this hope of a resurrection day for us. But our resurrection day is based on His resurrection day. You see, it's because He lives that we too shall live. That's why those two are linked together. There is coming a day when Christ returns, and that's resurrection day for us. But it's based on the power and the promise of Easter Sunday. What happened at Easter matters to us. Yes, Jesus is coming, and He's going to raise us from the dead, and He's also then going to intercede for us. Now I'm talking about Judgment Day and the proceedings that happen there. You know, I go back to Job, and Job speaks of his Redeemer. The Redeemer that Job had in mind throughout the book of Job was his defense lawyer, who would show up and rescue him from his troubles, defend his honor, speak back against those who had spoken against him. He talks about that through the book because the, the setting of the book of Job, the imagery is the imagery of a courtroom. God is sitting on the, the judgment throne. He's got the heavenly court there to be the jury. Satan walks in. The name Satan refers to the prosecutor who brings charges, and he brought charges against Job. Job's there as the defendant. There's only one person that's missing. He hasn't shown up yet. He's been silent. It's my advocate. It's my defense attorney. Job says, he's there, I believe he's there. I've got a witness in heaven. I've got an advocate on high. He's there, he just hasn't shown up yet, but he's coming one day. I know he's coming, and he will take his stand next to me. Paul uses that same imagery to describe what's going to happen to us at the second coming. In Romans chapter 8, he says, you and I will be there, God on the throne. Oh, Satan will still be mouthing off like he always does, but we've got Jesus. He describes Jesus this way in Romans 8. Christ died, he, he was raised, and then he ascended to heaven. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father on the throne. What's he waiting for? The day that he will intercede for us. He'll speak in our defense and get us through the judgment. And then once through the judgment, one more thing. Because Jesus is then is going to take us home. That's the ultimate hope of all the saints, Old Testament and New, to be taken home to the presence of God. Job thinks about that in that passage where he says, I know my Redeemer lives. One day he's coming back and taking his stand. He goes on to say, and then I'm going to see God. Oh, my flesh will disappear, yet even in the flesh, I'm going to see God. And what a day that will be. He says, my heart faints. I'm so excited. I hope you're excited for that day as well. I hope you are just like those saints of old who could say like David did in the 23rd Psalm, I'm going to one day dwell in the house of the Lord forever. See, that's what we look forward to. And all of those future expectations we have through Jesus Christ, they start at Easter Sunday and His resurrection from the grave. Because when He rose from the grave, He showed us He had the power to bring us life as well. It's a power He'll bring one day when He comes back and raises from the dead and then takes us through the judgment as our intercessor and ultimately delivers us to the presence of our Heavenly Father. What a great day that will be. Now, when I think about what we know and what we don't know, I have to admit there's a whole lot that we don't know. 
I've got a lot of Bible questions. I'd like to still find out what the answers are, maybe in heaven someday. I'll tell you something none of us really know, and that's our future, what lies ahead. We, we don't know how many more days we have, long or short. We don't know whether our future days are good days or bad days, or as we say in the vows, are they going to be richer or poor, sickness or health? I mean, we don't know what's coming. But Job reminds us there is one thing we do know for certain, all of us who are in Jesus Christ. I know that my Redeemer lives, and on the earth one day, He will stand. And that's the message I give you this day on Easter Sunday. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the hope we have through Jesus Christ. We thank you for that resurrection story of life for Him, but more than that, life for us as well through Jesus Christ. Because He lives, we too shall live. So we praise you, and we praise Christ. We praise the Holy Spirit whose power came on that Sunday and brought Him back to life. Father, we say thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. On behalf of all of us here at First Church, the staff, Timmy, Eli, Sandy, and Christy, our elders, our deacons, we want to wish you a happy Easter. As you spend time sheltering in place with your immediate family or make phone calls to your extended family, take some time to also reach out and call some of your church family. Let them know you miss them. Wish them the grace of the Lord and the peace of God on this Easter season. And until we gather together once again, will you be safe, be smart, and may God bless you.